kind of nation. Thomas Jefferson, John Marshall, and the epic struggle to create a United States, abridged by James F. Simon, read by Vincent Bagnall. The bitter and protracted struggle between President Thomas Jefferson and Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall defined the basic constitutional relationship between the executive and judicial branches of government. Weekday mornings during the month of February 1798, Vice President Thomas Jefferson walked three blocks from his rooms at Francis's Hotel in Philadelphia to Congress Hall, where he presided at the formal sessions of the Senate. When he had agreed to accept the nation's second highest elective office, Jefferson had thought that his duties would be modest and not unpleasant, and that expectation had dissolved in the welter of fierce feuding between the ruling Federalists and his Republicans. By the winter of 1798, after nearly a year in office, neither House of Congress was engaged in serious legislative business. Instead, the members were reduced to partisan bickering. Federalist Congressman Roger Griswold of Connecticut had taunted Matthew Lyon, a Republican from Vermont, that he had used a wooden sword in his military service during the Revolutionary War. Lyon replied by spitting in Griswold's face. Griswold retaliated on the floor of the House by beating Lyon with a cane. The Federalists in the House then solemnly took up the business of whether to expel the spitting beast, Lyon, from the chamber. The motion fell short of the required two-thirds needed for expulsion. Jefferson wrote James Madison, who had returned to private life in Virginia, that such a spectacle could only degrade the federal government in the public's view. He was also infuriated by the Federalists' attempt to rob the Republicans of a precious vote in the House, where the Federalists held a narrow majority. One floor above the House chamber, Jefferson presided over the Senate from a high-backed red leather chair behind a mahogany table covered with a silk cloth. He was by now 54 years old. The vice president usually appeared calm as he sat expressionless in the front of the room. But that February of 1798, he, like everyone else in the chamber, was anxiously awaiting word from the three American envoys in Paris, Elbridge Jerry, John Marshall, and Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, whom President Adams had appointed eight months earlier, to attempt to negotiate a peace settlement with the French government. No news, Jefferson wrote General Horatio Gates, was good news. As if to reassure himself as well as Gates, Jefferson offered reasons for his optimism. If the dispositions at Paris threatened war, it is impossible that our envoys should not find some means of putting us on our guard. And since there had been no such warnings from Paris, Jefferson concluded, peace then must be probable. Now, the long war between France and Great Britain continued to pose serious problems for the United States, particularly on the high seas, where both belligerents were freely plundering unarmed American merchant ships. Great Britain could claim that she was acting within the terms of the Jay Treaty of 1794, which did not recognize the principles of neutral commerce and, in general, acquiesced in British maritime rule and practice. Jefferson had condemned the Jay Treaty, charging that it gave unfair advantage to Great Britain. And as the war between the two great powers continued, Jefferson reluctantly conceded in the letter to General Gates that France could pillage American commercial ships with the same abandon permitted Great Britain under Jay's treaty. In fact, I apprehend that those two great nations will think it in their interests for us not to be navigators. Madison was not sanguine about the prospects for a peace treaty with France, primarily because of the obstacles posed by the Jay Treaty. To the pragmatic Madison, France appeared to have no reason to make peace with the United States except on the same terms that the U.S. had offered Great Britain. Madison did not interpret the silence from Paris as a sign of good news. In early March, Jefferson's optimism was shattered when reports from the American envoys in Paris were received. President Adams announced that the envoys had 
held out no hope for successful negotiations with the French. He reported further that the governing French directory had issued a decree ordering the seizure of British goods on neutral ships. Ten days later, Adams declared that the U.S. would take aggressive defensive measures, including the creation of a formidable navy and the arming of merchant ships to protect her interests on the high seas. Now, Jefferson's response was disbelief and anger. He labeled Adams' speech insane and began to refer to the Federalists as the War Party. He proposed that Congress adjourn and that the representatives return to their home districts, where he was confident they would learn that the American voters did not share the Federalists' exuberance for military measures. The Republicans demanded that the Adams administration disclose fully the correspondence from the American envoys. Jefferson and Madison believed the president had distorted the communications for his party's advantage. Defending the President While John Marshall slogged through Richmond in the winter of 1799 searching for votes, Vice President Jefferson presided over the Federalist-controlled Senate in Philadelphia and kept a watchful eye on the activities in the House of Representatives. The Army and Navy are steadily pursued, Jefferson wrote his son-in-law Thomas Mann Randolph. Underscoring Jefferson's observation, the Federalist Congressional Majority voted substantially increased military appropriations and authorized a loan of $5 million from the federal government to pay for it. Putting the nation on a war footing was central to the political ambitions of the high Federalists who were determined to discourage new diplomatic initiatives that might bring a settlement between the United States and France, and they successfully sponsored the Logan Bill, which prohibited communication between any private American citizen and a foreign government. The bill's immediate target was Dr. George Logan, a close friend of Jefferson's, who had embarked on a personal diplomatic mission to France in an attempt to repair the relations between the two countries. Logan had returned to the U.S. in November 1798, convinced that a peace settlement was possible. In a four-hour-long harangue on the floor of the House in support of the Logan Bill, the high Federalist leader Robert Goodlow Harper denounced Logan's mission and hinted that Logan and his sponsor, Jefferson, were guilty of treason. As the high Federalists prevailed in Congress, the President was moving in a different direction. On February 18, 1799, Adams announced that he would appoint William Vance Murray, the American envoy at The Hague, to represent the U.S. in new peace negotiations with the French government. This was a stunning reversal of policy by the president, who, having shocked friend and foe, quickly left Philadelphia to join his ailing wife, Abigail, at their home in Quincy, Massachusetts. Only ten months earlier, Adams had encouraged the spreading anti-French martial spirit with bellicose rhetoric. But the pledges of patriotism were followed by demands from the high Federalists for a large standing army to be commanded by their leader, Alexander Hamilton. Adams had favored a modest navy solely for defensive purposes and only reluctantly acquiesced in the high Federalists' call for a peacetime standing army, led by Hamilton, a man Adams deeply distrusted. Congress had been forced not only to borrow large sums of money, but to raise new taxes. And for what purpose? Presumably to prepare for a war that neither the U.S. nor France seemed to want. Since the failed negotiations with Paris the previous spring, France's military fortunes had taken a dramatic turn for the worse. Britain's Admiral Horatio Nelson had defeated the French fleet at the Nile, and French troops had suffered surprising defeats in land battles. And those setbacks, coupled with the militancy of the Adams administration toward France, helped persuade the French government that it should make peace with the United States. Adams began cautiously to give credence to reports from Murray at The Hague, as well as from Jerry, that the French now sought an honorable peace, when the president announced his decision to appoint Murray as the new 
American envoy to France, he insisted on terms that would assure the U.S. representative a status equal to that of diplomats of other sovereign nations. But conspicuously absent from his announcement was the angry tone of his earlier declarations. The president offered a guarded message of hope for honest reconciliation. Historians of the Adams administration and Adams himself in retirement have pointed to the president's peace initiative as the major achievement of his presidency. At the time, however, Adams received meager encouragement. The high Federalists were incensed. Hamilton was reported to have dismissed Adams as a mere old woman and unfit for a president. Massachusetts' George Cabot wrote bitterly, Surprise, indignation, Grief and disgust followed each other in a quick succession in the breasts of the true friends of our country. Jefferson was no kinder to the president, even though he had long called for just such an initiative. He took grim satisfaction in the fact that Adams' party was graveled and divided, but noted that the Federalists continued to prepare for war. As to Adams' initiative, Jefferson wrote that it had been taken both grudgingly and tardily. At least, he concluded, it silences all arguments against the sincerity of France. John Marshall was one of the few prominent Federalists to endorse Adams' initiative. He did so in a letter to Adams' Attorney General Charles Lee, a month after the President's announcement. Marshall's gesture was the first of many instances of political support for the President over the remainder of his term, which endeared him to Adams. And once he was in the House, Marshall rallied other Southern Federalist congressmen to support Adams' policy. And working toward an honorable peace settlement with France was clearly in the best foreign policy interests of the United States. At the level of pragmatic politics, the peace initiative also made good sense. Adams and presumably Marshall had appraised the president's chances for re-election and realized that the high Federalist policies, intractable opposition to peace negotiations with France, an increasingly expensive standing army, new taxes were political deadweights that would probably doom his candidacy. After Adams nominated Murray for the new peace mission, irate high Federalists blocked his appointment in Senate committee. The president responded by expanding the delegation, adding Chief Justice Oliver Ellsworth and Virginia's Patrick Henry, who declined and was replaced by North Carolina Governor William R. Davey. It was a tactical move by Adams to salvage his peace initiative in the face of stiff opposition from conservatives within his own party. Jefferson brooded nonetheless fearing that the addition of Ellsworth and Davy was a dilatory tactic calculated to diminish the mission's chance of success. Republican leaders in the House of Representatives were dealt a maddening defeat by the Federalist majority when they had attempted to debate the merits of the Alien and Sedition Acts in January 1799. Whenever a Republican spoke, Jefferson reported to Madison. The Federalists began to enter into loud conversations, laugh, cough, etc., so that for the last hour of these gentlemen speaking, they must have had the lungs of a Vendu master to have been heard. But Jefferson, understandably irritated, realized that his opponents were making a tactical error. He was convinced that the furor over the XYZ affair, which he labeled the XYZ delusion, had begun to dissipate, thanks largely to the public's general revulsion at the Alien and Sedition Acts. He noted with satisfaction that Congress was almost daily bombarded with petitions, sent primarily from the states of New York, New Jersey and Pennsylvania protesting the laws. The petitions were tangible evidence that Republican arguments against the oppressive laws, most dramatically articulated in the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions, were having the desired effect on public opinion. <laughs> 
What Jefferson feared most was that the protests against the laws would turn violent, as reportedly appeared likely in several sections of Pennsylvania. Firmness on our part, but passive firmness, is the true course, he wrote Madison. Anything rash or threatening might check the favorable dispositions of these middle states and rally them again around the measures which are ruining us. Outside of Philadelphia, the Republicans were more than holding their own in the state elections in the southern and middle Atlantic states, as Republican victories in the Virginia gubernatorial and assembly races demonstrated. Jefferson knew that Republican successes in state legislative elections were crucial if the Republicans were to win the 1800 presidential election, since more than half of the states provided that the state legislatures appoint their presidential electors, Jefferson was intent on making certain that the Republican message was effectively spread through word of mouth, the Republican press, and the publication and wide distribution of political pamphlets. And by the late summer of 1799, almost a year after he had drafted the Kentucky Resolutions, Jefferson wrote to Wilson Carey Nicholas, the neighbor who had delivered the resolutions to John Breckinridge, proposing that the Republicans renew their protest by responding to Congress and to states that ignored or rejected their arguments in the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. Jefferson recommended that they reiterate his basic objection that Congress, by ignoring the essential compact among the states, had exceeded its constitutional authority in passing the laws. Repeated violations of the compact, Jefferson believed, would justify overt defiance by the states. But realizing that his arguments could be constructed as advocating secession, Jefferson suggested to Nicholas that the Republicans express in affectionate and conciliatory language our warm attachment to union with our sister states and to the instrument and principles with which we are united. Indeed, Jefferson conceded union was worth the sacrifice of everything except the rights of self-government. Confident that the good sense of the American people would prevail and that the Alien and Sedition Acts would be overturned, Jefferson nonetheless reserved the right of the states to secede if all else failed. Union, he wrote to Nicholas, was not worth the price of self-government, which we have never yielded and which alone we see liberty, safety, and happiness. Fangs of Jefferson. After he was selected to lead the Republicans' presidential ticket in 1800, Jefferson projected the image of a political ascetic, wishing only that his pure Republican principles be put before the voters. He told his opponent John Adams that the presidential contest had nothing to do with their personalities and everything to do with their conflicting political principles. We were both to die today, Jefferson told Adams. Tomorrow, two other names would be put in the place of ours, without any change in the motion of the machinery. As the candidate of lofty principle, Jefferson often appeared to view the day-to-day -day business of winning the presidency as beneath him, or at least irrelevant to his role as the Republican standard-bearer. His determination to avoid any opportunity to bring public attention to himself was apparent when he made plans to return to Virginia after the adjournment of the spring congressional term. He wrote Virginia Governor Monroe that he had hoped to meet with him in Richmond before returning to Monticello, but he cautioned Monroe that their meeting should take place without the public's knowledge. Besides my hatred of ceremony, Jefferson wrote Monroe, I believe it better to avoid every occasion for the impression of sentiments which might drag me into the newspapers. He acknowledged that the Federalists had put public displays to political powerful use, rallying support by furnishing occasions for the flame of public opinion to break out 
from time to time. But Jefferson thought such public events unnecessary, even detrimental, to the achievement of his ambitious goals. And despite his public image of detachment, Jefferson was anything but aloof in his behind-the-scenes political activities. He and Madison, in particular, discussed both broad issues of political principle and specific strategies for partisan advantage. Jefferson had firm ideas on how to exploit the growing fissure between the moderate and conservative Federalist factions over the Second Paris Peace Commission and the related issue of a standing army. He knew that Adams and Marshall supported the peace mission and wanted to maintain the army only for defensive purposes, whereas the high Federalists, led by Hamilton, opposed any settlement with France and favored an expansive, permanent military presence. Jefferson believed it was important that the Republicans give the warring Federalist factions no reason to unite on the issues. Republicans should continue to advocate a peace settlement with France without saying or doing anything that could provide the Federalists a pretext for keeping a large standing army in peacetime. At the same time that he was setting the broad parameters of the Republicans' national strategy, Jefferson maintained a very active interest in his party's organization, down to the local county level, as his directive to Virginia's Republican chairman to distribute Thomas Cooper's political arithmetic demonstrated. He was, moreover, vigilant in urging that the party's message be widely disseminated by the fervent Republican press and the party's most effective pamphleteers. He could justifiably deny that he was the chief juggler of partisan Republican writers like Duane, Cooper, and Callender, but he knew and encouraged their work. Jefferson also demonstrated a sure grasp of the electoral process. He prided himself on his ability to know how each state's electors were likely to vote, and indeed boasted that in the 1796 presidential election, his prediction was within one or two votes of the outcome. He was somewhat less confident of his prognostications in 1800, but nonetheless ventured to make an educated estimate of the Republicans' chances. Shortly after his election, President Jefferson predicted that his Republican ship of state would experience a deservedly smoother voyage than the tumultuous journey of his Federalist predecessor. Midway through his first term, he could take pride in the seaworthiness of his Republican vessel. Jefferson and the Republican Congress had succeeded impressively with their domestic agenda. And in the field of foreign affairs, Jefferson had achieved the greatest triumph of his presidency, the purchase from France of the Louisiana Territory, which more than doubled the size of the United States. He had accomplished his objectives by a blend of ideology and pragmatism, exalting Republican principles but working within practical political limits. The finest example of Jefferson's technique was the Louisiana Purchase. Had he adhered to rigid Republican principles, it would have been impossible to complete negotiations without a constitutional amendment. Jefferson had long insisted on a narrow reading of federal constitutional powers, maintaining that no branch was authorized to take action not explicitly provided for in the Constitution. Recall that in 1791, Jefferson, as Washington's Secretary of State, contended that no provision in the Constitution allowed Congress to establish a national bank. He lost the debate with Alexander Hamilton, who argued that Article I of the Constitution must be interpreted broadly to permit Congress to take all necessary and proper steps to accomplish legitimate ends. In 1803, the acquisition of the Louisiana Territory posed an uncomfortable problem for the president under a strict constitutional view of federal authority. The government could not take the action required to purchase the territory. 
No provision in the Constitution allowed it. Jefferson drafted a constitutional amendment that would authorize the purchase, but he received word from his negotiators in Paris that Napoleon was increasingly nervous about the sale. Whatever his reservations, Jefferson quickly overcame them and urged his supporters in Congress to ratify the purchase in silence and with as little debate as possible, and particularly so far as respects the constitutional difficulty. But during that same year, Jefferson's judgment failed him when he was considering another issue with constitutional implications and in the process caused a rift between radical and moderate Republicans. The miscalculation occurred over what more should be done about the Federalist-dominated judiciary after the successful repeal of the Judiciary Act of 1801. Radical Republicans such as William Branch Giles urged severing the Federalist judicial branch. No remedy is competent to redress the evil system, he wrote Jefferson in June 1801, but an absolute repeal of the whole judiciary and terminating the present offices and creating a new system. Other radical Republicans, particularly the florid orator of the House, John Randolph of Reinecke, were ready to make good on Giles' threat, with or without the president's instruction. Although Jefferson never supported the most radical measures advocated by Giles and Randolph, he approved the removal of Federalist judges who had demonstrated blatant partisanship on the bench. Jefferson's bitter memory of the active role that members of the Federalist judiciary had played in defending the Sedition Act, and in many cases aiding prosecutions under the law, was still vivid. He believed that there was more work to be done to eliminate the last vestiges of Federalist tyranny. My opinion is that two or three years more will bring back to the fold of republicanism all our wandering brethren whom the cry of wolf scattered in 1798, he wrote New York Governor George Clinton. Till that is done, let every man stand to his post and hazard nothing by change. The first Republican attacks on the Federalist judiciary came far from Washington in what was then the Pennsylvania state capital, Lancaster, where the Republicans controlling the legislature sought to remove the most partisan Federalist judicial holdovers, and they began with the chief judge of the state's Western Judicial District, Alexander Addison, an outspoken defender of the Sedition Act. In 1798, Addison had published a spirited defense of the legislation that impressed George Washington, who, in turn, sent a copy of the judge's essay to John Marshall. Treason Against the United States Shortly before noon, on March the 4th, 1805, President Thomas Jefferson, accompanied by his private secretary and groom, boarded a carriage in front of the President's house and was driven to the still-unfinished Capitol building to deliver his second inaugural address. The Senate chamber that had churned with anticipation of a new political era four years earlier was relatively bare and lifeless. Many senators, exhausted by the Chase impeachment trial just completed, chose to skip the presidential ceremony altogether in favor of returning to their home states. The three men who had shared the inaugural stage in 1801, President Jefferson, Chief Justice John Marshall, and Vice President Aaron Burr, were again present. But Burr, was now relegated to a seat in the public gallery. His precipitous drop in status in official Washington, he had been the presiding officer in this same Senate chamber only three days earlier, was the least of his problems. He was desperately in debt and shorn of influence in Jefferson's administration. And now, Burr's once thriving New York City law practice was closed to him. 
for he was under indictment in both New York and New Jersey for the murder of Alexander Hamilton. Burr's dire circumstances would have crushed a less ambitious and resourceful man, but even before he had vacated the office of vice president, Burr had begun to plan a Western adventure that contemplated fortune, fame, and, if entirely successful, possibly a throne for himself in Mexico City. Unfortunately for Burr, the plan would fail miserably. Worse, he would be forced to stand trial in 1807 on charges of treason in the courtroom of Chief Justice Marshall. Marshall's rulings during the Burr trial chagrined and enraged President Jefferson, who, in a prior address to Congress, had preemptively announced Burr's guilt. The Chief Justice's decisions not only were instrumental in leading to Burr's acquittal, but set the standards for executive privilege and treason that are the starting points for modern constitutional doctrine. The Burr trial, moreover, irrevocably embittered Jefferson toward the Chief Justice, a feeling that was reciprocated by Marshall and that deepened in their old age. Ten months before Jefferson's second inauguration, Burr had met with Brigadier General James Wilkinson, the stout, hard-drinking, and shrewd commander-in-chief of the U.S. Army. And throughout his career, Wilkinson had demonstrated a flair for intrigue and a genius for wriggling in and out of tight situations. As a young military man, he had been dismissed from the Continental Army for gross irregularities in his accounts. He nonetheless succeeded General Anthony Wayne as commander of the U.S. Army in 1796, and even then, he was the paid double agent of the Spanish government, having already collected $26,000 from Spain for his services. When Wilkinson called the Vice President Burr's Richmond Hill Country Estate, when Wilkinson called at Vice President Burr's Richmond Hill Country Estate on the northern outskirts of New York City in May 1804, the two men studied manuscript maps of Texas, New Mexico, and Spain's other American possessions, anticipating a military expedition to conquer those colonies. But when Burr later met with Anthony Mary, the British minister to the U.S., the avowed purpose of his Western expedition had changed. The vice president told Mary that he had planned to lead a secessionist movement of the Western states against the Union and asked for His Majesty's government's financial and military help. Whether Burr intended to lead a secessionist movement, as he told Mary, or only to wheedle funds from the British with the promise of treachery against his own country, is a question that historians continue to debate. After a parade of 48 witnesses before the grand jury, many of them summoned at the urging of the administration, Burr was indicted on charges of treason and high misdemeanor. The juror's true bill accusing Burr of treason was taken verbatim from Prosecutor Hayes' charge. Aaron Burr, being under the protection of the laws of the U.S. and owing allegiance thereto not having the fear of God before his eyes, but being moved and seduced by the instigation of the devil, wickedly desiring and intending the peace and tranquility for the said United States to disturb and foster, move, and excite insurrection, rebellion, and war against the said United States on the 10th day of December 1806 at a certain place called and known by the name of Blennerhassett's Island in the county of Wood, District of Virginia, with force and arms unlawfully, falsely, maliciously, and traitoriously did compass, imagine, and intend to raise and levy war, insurrection, and rebellion against the said United States. A marshal immediately understood that the grand jurors had applied the definition of constructive treason that he had given in his Supreme Court opinion in Bowman. In that opinion, he wrote that a defendant could be charged with treason even if his participation in the assembling of troops was minute, or he was actually removed from the scene. Burr had left Blennerhassett Island two days before there was any assembling of troops. Yet under Marshall's definition of constructive treason, Burr's absence from the island did not prevent him from being charged with treason, and that was precisely the grand jury's conclusion. After reading the indictment, Marshall had second thoughts about how he had defined treason. Anticipating that he would have to rule on the issue when Burr stood trial in early August, he decided to explore the implications of his early opinion with his Supreme Court colleagues. Among the issues Marshall raised with his brethren was the extent to which American courts were obliged to follow the British law of constructive reason. 
How far is this doctrine to be carried in the United States? Marshall asked Associate Justice Cushing. If a body of men assemble for a treasonable purpose, does this implicate all those who are concerned in the conspiracy, whether acquainted with the assemblage or not? Does it implicate those who advised, directed, or approved of it? If Marshall and his colleagues continued to apply the doctrine of constructive treason in the August trial, the government's case against Burr would be significantly strengthened. Ought the expressions in that opinion be revised? Marshall asked Cushing. On August the 10th, Marshall convened the Federal Circuit Court in the state legislative chamber to decide whether Aaron Burr was guilty of treason against the United States. Final Battles In late June 1807, Jefferson received a letter from Governor William Claiborne of the Orleans Territory. Would the President intervene on behalf of the United States to prevent Edward Livingston, former Republican member of the House of Representatives and a New Orleans attorney, from developing a small beachfront on the Mississippi River? But considering the national and international crisis he was confronting, the controversy did not seem worth Jefferson's attention. Yet the president responded to the governor's appeal, perhaps because Claiborne had been a loyal ally during the Burr conspiracy. Livingston, on the other hand, had gone to court to seek writs of habeas corpus for Bowman and Swartwout, the suspected Burr conspirators, after they had been jailed by General Wilkinson. Claiborne's request came to the president with a special urgency. If Jefferson did not intervene, the free flow of navigation down the Mississippi could be jeopardized. If Livingston were allowed to build a dam and levee, he could divert the river's flow with devastating effect. Claiborne told the president that Livingston's claim had so roiled local residents that bloodshed was likely. The sandbank was considered public property, and the local population had freely used it for their own purposes. The major obstacle to the president's intervention was a recent decision by the Superior Court of the Orleans Treaty supporting Livingston's claim. Because Louisiana was not a state, there was no way to appeal the territorial court's decision. Claiborne urged the president to ignore the court decision and the city of New Orleans claim on the grounds that the United States were the legitimate legal claimants of the land in question. Acting on an opinion by the Attorney General that was Riverfront was the federal government's property. Virtually every important case argued before the Marshall Court produced a galaxy of the nation's finest lawyers, and Gibbons v. Ogden was no exception. Daniel Webster, representing Gibbons with Attorney General William Wirt, proved to be the most influential advocate. He was determined to force the court to confront the broadest possible constitutional argument in favor of the federal government. New York's steamboat monopoly law was null and void. Webster asserted because Congress alone had the authority to regulate commerce on the navigable waters of the United States. Webster described Congress's authority to regulate commerce in the most expansive terms. It was full and complete, he said, embracing not only the buying and selling of goods, but also navigation. It included all commercial transaction between states, and it was exclusive, leaving no room for state regulation. After Webster and the other attorneys completed their arguments in Gibbons, Marshall sustained his injury, sending tremors of anxiety through the press that was following the great steamboat case closely. Could Marshall possibly write an opinion for the court, or would he, as rumored, assign the important judicial task to his colleague, Justice Story? On March 3rd, only two weeks after he lay unconscious from his fall, Marshall entered the thronged courtroom. His arms still in a sling, he was weak and moved slowly to his chair. His voice was low and unsteady as he began to read his opinion for a unanimous court. The opinion belied the debilitated physical condition of its author. It was a muscular pronouncement of broad federal power. Marshall described Congress's authority to regulate commerce with, with a breadth never yet exceeded, Justin Robert Jackson observed 118 years later. The Chief Justice borrowed some of Daniel Webster's arguments, even his very words, to assert that the framers intended for Congress to have full, unobstructed authority to regulate the nation's commercial relations. But then, as in so many of Marshall's other opinions, the Chief Justice decisively departed from an influential lawyer's arguments to make 
the opinion his own, and he admitted that Webster's argument that Congress possessed the exclusive authority to regulate commerce was tempting, but said that he did not have to make a final judgment on it in this case. Instead, he said that the case turned crucially on the conflict between New York's steamboat monopoly law and the Congressional Coasting Statute. The New York law could not stand because the Constitution made the federal law supreme. In the last paragraph of his opinion, Marshall issued a pointed warning to outspoken states' rights advocates like Jefferson and John Taylor. He conceded that ingenious minds could, by the narrowest possible interpretation of the Constitution, drastically reduce the powers of the federal government. But to indulge in that refined and metaphysical reasoning, Marshall wrote, would explain away the Constitution of our country and leave it a magnificent structure to look at, but totally unfit for use. The Gibbons decision was especially discouraging to Jefferson. Not only had Chief Justice Marshall announced another stunning nationalistic decision, but Jefferson's best hope for an independent voice on the court, Republican Justice William Johnson, wrote a concurring opinion that went even further than the Chief Justice in describing Congress's broad powers to regulate interstate commerce. And Johnson concluded that Congress's authority was exclusive, as Webster had argued. Marshall's opinion in Gibbons v. Ogden put to rest for all time any notion that the nation could return to balkanized commercial relations among the states that had existed under the unsuccessful Articles of Confederation. The effect of the court's decision was immediate. Only a year after New York's steamboat monopoly was broken up by the court, the number of steamboats plying their commercial trade in the New York's waters had increased from 6 to 43. Gibbons effectively made New York City the commercial center of the nation, opening up the Hudson River and Long Island Sound to a brisk, unfettered commercial traffic. Marshall's decision would later become the basis for extending Congress's interstate regulations to newer modes of transportation, beginning with railroads and to new forms of commerce, including nuclear power, again demonstrating Marshall's genius for glimpsing the nation's future. Jefferson had always perceived the battle between Republicans and Federalists as a moral struggle between good and evil, and he did not doubt who was on the side of the angels. In the early 1820s, the Federalists were no longer a viable opposition party, but the threat that they had represented to the Republic, in Jefferson's eyes, persisted. Although he no longer called his political enemies monarchists, preferring instead the appellation consolidationists, the meaning was the same. The Federalists still endangered what he saw as the true principles of Republican government by upsetting the necessary equilibrium between the federal and the state governments. In Jefferson's last years, John Marshall, above all other opposition leaders, retained the power to undermine the former president's Republican principles. The Marshall Court's decisions appalled Jefferson and the specter of Marshall manipulating his Republican colleagues on the court continued to infuriate and bewilder him. There was no worse danger to the Republic, Jefferson had warned his first appointee to the court, Associate Justice William Johnson, than the consolidation of our government by the noiseless and therefore unalarming instrumentality of the Supreme Court. But nothing, it seemed, could deter the Chief Justice. Not long before he died on July the 4th, 1826, Jefferson considered which of his many public accomplishments should be inscribed on his tombstone. Understandably, he ruled out any reference to his battles with John Marshall during or after his presidency. In his struggles with the Chief Justice, Jefferson had come off second best, as his repeated denunciations of Marshall's opinions attested. At the time of the Marbury decision, Jefferson did not appear overly concerned about the implications of Marshall's opinion, but upon reflection, and after Marshall began to speak for a unanimous court, in one nationalist decision after another, Jefferson recognized that the Chief Justice presented a formidable and seemingly invincible enemy. Jefferson's state's rights philosophy was subjected to one humiliation after another in the decisions of the Marshall Court. 
Jefferson's insistence during his retirement years that the federal government and the states represented two independent and equal sovereigns claimed the support of the most radical Republicans. Moderates like Madison and Monroe, though Jefferson's longtime allies, understood the need for a strong federal government. Madison in particular left no doubt that he believed that in a clash between federal and state authority under the Constitution, the states must defer to the supremacy of the federal government. And Jefferson's states' rights philosophy found new life in later generations, but the uses to which it was put probably would have appalled the nation's third president. Jefferson was, after all, committed to a United States, though his prescription for securing a strong union was radically different from Marshall's. But in the decade after Jefferson's death, John C. Calhoun developed a strain of his state's rights philosophy to justify the secession of southern states from the Union. And in the next century, segregationist governors from the South, such as Arkansas's Orville Faubus, trumpeted states' rights to justify their defiance of U.S. Supreme Court desegregation decrees. In response to Faubus's recalcitrance, a unanimous decision by the Warren Court in 1958, citing with approval Marshall's Marbury opinion, declared that the court was the final arbiter of the Constitution. Most recently, a five-member conservative majority of the Rehnquist Court has introduced its own expansive version of states' rights. Besides providing a factual account of the first 45 years of his life, Marshall reiterated his conviction that a strong federal government was essential to an enduring union. On his tombstone, Marshall chose to have recorded only the dates of his birth, of his marriage to Polly, and of his death. It was left to others to enumerate his achievements. And after Marshall died, Justice Story wrote a poetic tribute to Marshall. The great, the good, the wise. Even political leaders with different philosophies praised Marshall. His judicial opinions, said President Andrew Jackson, gave him a rank among the greatest men of his age. Marshall's legacy did not depend on eulogies. His circuit court opinion in U.S. v. Burr was later cited as precedent for the U.S. Supreme Court's position that no one, not even the president, is above the law. It has been a constitutional truism that resonated most dramatically 167 years after the Burr trial in U.S. v. Nixon, when Chief Justice Warren Burger, writing for a unanimous court, rejected President Richard Nixon's claim of executive privilege, insisting that he must turn over the Watergate tapes to the special prosecutor. Less than two weeks later, Nixon released the tapes, and three days later he resigned the presidency. Marshall's indispensable contributions to the nation are, moreover, found throughout the early volumes of the United States Reports, the official volumes of Supreme Court decisions. They begin with his opinion in Marbury v. Madison, in which the Chief Justice established the independence of the federal judiciary, and include Marshall's later judicial pronouncements, which translated his commitment to a strong federal government into constitutional law, from McCullough versus Maryland to Gibbons versus Ogden. He was the fourth leader of the Supreme Court, but because of his foundational court opinions, he is known to this day as the great Chief Justice. In the end, Jefferson reduced his most notable public achievements to three. First was his authorship of the Declaration of Independence. Second was his drafting of the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom. The third memorable accomplishment was a work in progress during his last years, the founding of the University of Virginia. In retrospect, Jefferson's choices were wise. He recognized then, as have generations of Americans since, that these deeds would serve as important symbols for the nation's values. His concept of a great public university at Charlottesville underscored his belief in the capacity of every citizen to improve through knowledge and education. 
After his drafts of the Declaration of Independence and the Statute for Religious Freedom were not only brilliantly crafted documents, but also transcending literary monuments to representative democracy and individual liberties. 